I'm Kevin Lynch. I work on software across Apple Watch and Health. And I am Deidre Kaldbeck, and I am on the product marketing team for Apple Watch and Health. And it's cool that Deidre came off the paddleboard and came into the office oh, no, I, for this. It's, it's underneath my feet. I'm just very stable. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we didn't get to see you dance again this year. Kevin, we didn't get to see you and Jules do a duet. And uh -huh. I did file a radar, expect the behavior dancing. Off camera. That was um, all off camera this year. <laughs> I'm actually really curious. Like if we go back to the beginning, the earliest days of the watch, when you were first read in or disclosed and you heard that Apple was making a watch, what went through your head? Like what was your immediate reaction? <laughs> uh, well, for me, that was actually day one when I started at Apple. The morning I started, um, uh, the story was, we want to build a watch and we've got to get going. In fact, we want to get going right now. We're feeling like we got to go fast. Um, and actually I was uh, advised to not even go to orientation. Like you don't even have time to go to orientation. Just get going. Uh, you know Apple well enough already uh, and get started. And so uh, it was a very rapid start. The, uh, um, the, the thing that went through my mind, uh, there's always, of course, occasionally rumors about what Apple's maybe working on. And, and um, But when you look at Apple Watch, I felt like like that was inevitable. Like like to to have Apple make a watch, I felt like that was the first thing that went through my head. Was of course oh, we're going to do that. Um, and if because if you look, uh, I love the history of computing. If you look at the history of computing, uh, it's a series of uh, it's the evolution of smaller and smaller uh, computing devices that are more and more powerful. And it goes from you know mainframes to mini computers to desktop computers, you know laptops, portables, mobile phones. And so that evolution of, of power and, and, and miniaturization. Uh, leads you to well, what's next? What's what's next after after the phone? And um, and that really leads you to something as small as a, as a watch. And the 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 watch is is a natural location on your body. If you start thinking about something that's even smaller than a mobile phone, which is already pretty small, uh, it's like, well, where would you put it? How would you carry it? How would you look at it? And um, and um, and so attaching it to your arm was a really really natural natural place to do that. So that so that that was really interesting. And so of course, going through my head then was. This is going to be an incredibly challenging project. Like, how do you get a compelling interaction on a really tiny display? Uh, and battery life, of course, is going to be a, an issue, which is a major challenge. And so, designing around that uh, was, from an engineering perspective, really interesting challenge, which which I love. Uh, and then also this really this great opportunity and really a sense of responsibility for a for working on a device that is actually on your body, like you wear with you, like that responsibility is really significant. Uh, you know, how do we make something that people will feel really good about, uh, that that's supportive and empowering for them, uh, not kind of bugging them. Uh, so that 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 kind of philosophy around how we design uh, all of our interactions is really sensitive to that. Unlike Kevin, I had no idea what was going on. You know, um, Apple is is very good at uh, making sure that we keep our surprises surprises um, for both employees and our users. And so I was working on iOS and actually what I worked on initially was the health app because I worked on iOS. Um, and Kevin's team uh, was working on the health app, but I was on the iOS product marketing side. And so we were working out how to help tell the story of this whole new health app um, in iOS 8. And what I thought was amazing was we were going to be able to talk about how you could bring all of your health data together from third-party apps and devices, and little did I know that one of those devices was soon to be Apple Watch. So it was actually a really exciting thing for me to, to, as you said, to be read in or sworn in on the secret of Apple Watch um, much closer to when we actually announced it. Um, so I, I really wasn't told about it until um, I think just a few weeks before the announcement, and I was very fortunate to be one of the people to to show it off to our our uh, our audience at the um, at the event in the all hands in the hands on area. So I learned about it honestly, just probably the same way you did, Renee. And that was that was a really neat thing for me to to work at Apple and and hear about it like everyone else. So it was cool. My dad worked at IBM and he got an Apple II Plus so he wouldn't have to drive downtown to use the mainframes. And I had an iPhone. I wouldn't even have to go back to my Mac to do certain really important things. And then I got an Apple Watch and it can't do as much as an iPhone, uh, but it can do these brief, frequent, but really critically important things without me even having to reach into my pocket or reach onto the desk for my iPhone. And it occurred to me that it took until like iOS 5 and iCloud before the iPhone was really that independent from the Mac 
uh, or the PC running iTunes. But systematically over the years with like on-device logic and on-device app store and bringing LTE over and just continuing, now you have the, the family sharing where you can set up a watch for somebody, you know, you are systematically just increasing the functionality. And I know that, you know, Apple is not shy about cannibalizing their own devices. You'd much rather do it than have somebody else do it. But is that like a, not a predatory process where you're looking at the iPhone and going, what can we do next? But is that like more of an organic thing where as time and technology allows, you'll just keep building up the functionality and the things that we're capable of doing from our wrist? The work we're doing there is really how can we empower people with Apple Watch and in different situations, whether you're near your phone or away from your phone. Um, and you've seen us doing that more and more over time, for sure. Uh, but really, the main focus is 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 how all of our devices work really well together. Uh, and it kind of when you interact with each one of them, what are you trying to accomplish? And each of the devices has its own kind of personality and way of going about things. Um, so, like you were saying with Apple Watch, the little brief interactions is really core to how Apple Watch works. And we 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 started with that, and that's how it's. Uh, um, Different than like if you're using your Mac, you'll tend to use it for longer periods of time and phone, you know, like you were saying, less than your Mac, but more than your watch. So there, there are these kind of interaction times uh, that are very different across the devices. And when we started working on Apple Watch, we thought that time of interaction might be maybe something like 10 seconds. Like we were kind of estimating what those typical interactions might be like. And it was really interesting when we started actually living with, with the watch uh, internally, we started learning that really you want to do those interactions even short, in shorter times than that, more like two seconds rather than 10 seconds. And that's a tall order uh, to do a, do some of these tasks in two seconds. Uh, we weren't sure how we could do that. Uh, so we actually, we, we paused what we were doing for a moment. We had everybody go and brainstorm for a bunch of different areas of the system. How could we possibly make those happen in two seconds? Like no no rules. Like you can do whatever you want. You could change the the interaction of the system. You can make shortcuts. You can uh, take stuff out. Like whatever whatever it is, make it two seconds. And we made a list of those things, um, and that was super productive. Uh, w one of the examples of that is the messages app. You know, when you receive a, a message, um, it used to be initially when you replied, you had to kind of go into reply and then go go to a compose view and then press send, um, and that took more than two seconds. Now uh, in messages, which has been this way for a long time now on the watch, uh, when you receive a message, you can just scroll up with your digital crown. There's a bunch of suggested replies that we've generated for you, and there's some you can edit if you want, um, and you just tap them. So scroll and tap. And so when you receive a message, that scroll and tap, you can totally do in less than two seconds. And so we went, went across and did a bunch of that. Same for like wallet, doing Apple Pay, like the, the, just a whole bunch of areas of the system we went and tuned in. And um, that... That that type of investment in time and engineering is 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 makes a huge difference, um, and it's it's sometimes like what are you removing more than what are you adding? That's one of the things I love most about Apple Watch because like the the downside of focus is sometimes tunnel vision, but it really seems like over the last few years, even though health and fitness have become so popular, have gotten so much attention, the original sort of promises of the Apple Watch also included payments and authentication and remote control and communication and all these other things. And you've been systematically improving those as well, whether it's walkie talkie or now the intercom system, the new home app, uh, you know, way more robust. And one of the things that interests me the most is uh, keys and IDs, because this just takes, it, it both simplifies the process of authentication, identity and control, but also greatly empowers it. Can you talk just a little bit about how that, how those new technologies work? This is an area we've been working on for many years, and it's really exciting. The, the infrastructure is really well understood now, and we're at the beginning of it kind of rolling out this, this, this generation of, of, of access to your home, your office, your car, uh, hotel rooms. So each of these categories has its own way of implementing this. And, we've imp and then we've designed it on Apple Watch so you can just use tap to access, just like you do with Apple Pay uh, using NFC. These are, you can make them so they're, they have express mode turned on, we call it. So you can just tap and access whatever it is you're using. And with the proximity uh, of NFC, uh, you have, there's an intent. You know, you're waving your device in front of the lock to cause it to unlock. So there's not this guesswork about whether it's unlocking or not. You still have a gesture that's involved to do the unlock. Um, so I think we've got uh, a really a great approach to this now and super excited for it to, to start rolling out. Previously, we talked a lot about how messages and um, photos and things like that were really what kept you connected. And now we have this 
this evolution of the watch where it's your identity, it brings you, it allows you to control the things around you and access the, the places you love. And I mean, um, if you think about Apple Watch as your identity, we started with with Apple Pay. You know, we you um, when it's on your wrist, it's that's your identity. And we we've recently used it as your identity for when you want to unlock your iPhone and you're wearing a mask. Um, and now with these Watch OS eight updates, with things like State ID and you know the home app redesign and these other wallet features, it's it's really starting to be more of this identity access and control where it's has it's the safety and security of a device that's always on you. So it's it's really perfect for for all of these um, these capabilities. I'm always continuously impressed and inspired by the accessibility technologies that Apple brings to all of their products. But I think that demo of assistive touch on the Apple Watch. It just next level blew people like straight up science fiction away. And I was wondering like, how do you sort of realize all of this potential and sometimes maybe even take it further than anybody imagined? Yeah, these are deep collaborations across multifunctional teams. So it's so it's design, accessibility, engineering, um, storytelling, marketing, uh, you know, it's the it's all it's all the all the different teams work on projects like this. And it's the combination that really makes them awesome. And on that one, uh, there were lots of explorations like more uh, gross movements of your arm, shaking your arm, rotating your arm, lots of lots of things like that. Um, those require energy as well. So we thought about like how much energy does it take to do these different gestures? And if you're using assistive touch, you want to be really thoughtful about how much energy every time and every every interaction. And so we settled on 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 a couple that work really well from a low energy human energy perspective, but are really hard to sense. Uh, and the and the two are there's four signals: uh, clench, double clench, and then we did pinch and double pinch. And and the sensing of that is happening on your watch, and it's using you know gyro, the accelerometer. It's looking at micro movements of your arm when you do those gestures. It actually uses the heart rate sensor as well and gets the imaging feedback from your from your arm uh, included with the gyro and the accelerometer. So those are all blended together with machine learning. We've created models uh, to capture these gestures. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible uh, a few years ago, uh, and it's just as we're starting to understand. Uh, how we can use these approaches in, in terms of building software, and also the capability, the performance of Apple Watch has gotten so incredible. Uh, we can run these things live now. And we, we've been working on accessibility in Apple Watch since day one. We first shipped Apple Watch. Uh, we were thinking about uh, how to enable people with this. And um, it's been such a, such a pleasure working across all the teams uh, on this. And the team members in the, in the assistive technology uh, area have just you know really been brilliant and have been working uh, as part of the integrated Apple Watch team since the beginning. I, I love it. I love your dedication, like the plural, your dedication to accessibility and also health. Uh, you know, m just the way you've been ramping up health. And you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, but like Apple Watch has been a big focus of health, but now you have mobility and it's sort of tying in the iPhone in a way that's really Apple Watch style, like using the sensor fusion and the machine learning on device and, and taking all of that and giving us really useful preventative information. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, is the Apple Pencil one day going to be able to tell me I have RSI or carpal tunnel? Like, is this the beginning of some great Apple ecosystem health thing? Uh, but I'm, I'm curious, like when you... When you see this escalating across multiple Apple devices now, Deidre, how do you, um, well, well, first, can you talk about bringing this kind of technology to the iPhone and maybe how people will use it or get the most out of using it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you said said it perfectly when when you said that, you know, we do kind of think about our entire ecosystem of devices and the capabilities within each of those devices. And Really, our goal is always to empower people to better manage their health. And whether there are sensors on the watch or the phone or Apple Pencil um, that can, can that can pri uh, that can offer that 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 empowerment for our users, that's actually where we'll focus the investment and the energy. And um, you know, with walking steadiness, it's it's something that. As you said, we we really wanted to think about how can we prevent these these falls. We we introduced fall detection with Apple Watch Series Four, and of course, it's been incredibly rewarding to to hear the stories from our from our users who have have been have benefited from that feature. But 
you know, if you think about it, gosh, wouldn't it be better if that fall had never occurred in the first place? And um, we know that Apple Watch has amazing health sensors, the motion sensors, the heart rate sensor. Um, even we're using the microphone for health features with the noise app. Um, but the iPhone also has, as you know, motion sensors. And in this particular case, the motion sensors on the phone and, and the where you actually carry your iPhone typically in your back pocket or your front pocket or maybe... Um, a shoulder bag or a, um, a crossbody bag, those sensors actually can pick up those those subtle signals from your hip movement that can actually give us the fidelity that we we need to um, provide you with those mobility metrics that can then give you the signal for when you might be at a, an increased risk of falling. So of course, the, the, the watch similarly has powerful motion sensors and, and some of those mobility metrics are from the watch, things like uh, stair ascent speed and stair descent speed. We can only get that from the watch because of the way the watch is positioned and you often may not have your phone with you when you're going up and down stairs. And so we're trying to, to think about the best place to get the best data to provide the best experience. And in this case, um, the iPhone uh, is was really best positioned for this. And that, that certainly gives us the opportunity to offer it to all of the iPhone users um, and not just Apple watch users, but we know that combination of phone and watches is really powerful for, for a lot of these health features. Always felt to me like the the phone was like the starship and the watch was like the shuttlecraft. Ooh. And you can just get so much done by going back and forth. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> between I love it. those things. A walking steadiness actually came initially from fall detection. So we're doing fall detection on Apple Watch. We're all working on it. And it, it's and it's incredible uh, how that's been helping people. And we, we get we still get letters about that, but uh, we were thinking as we're working on it, uh, well, how can we prevent people from falling? Like rather than just detecting that they're falling, can we actually stop them from falling? And that just led through this really interesting journey of uh, discovery and brainstorming about, um, while we may not be able to stop you in the moment from falling. I love um, that you very carefully walked around disclosing any potential anti-gravity fall prevention technology <laughs> that you might have at play after you teased us so mercilessly with the teleportation. Uh, you know, a, a couple of years ago, and then Craig escalated to portal technology, mm -hmm. you know, through his Aperture Science app uh, just, just just this week. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that your whatever vibranium casing you're using is still in the future, but you're you're trying to you're trying to give us t tools we can use today. At this in the time. meantime, exactly doing what we can. Exactly. Yes. We actually did this really uh, deep work that has taken years of uh, sensing these different attributes that Deirdre was uh, mentioning, um, and then and then doing studies where. Uh, we partly used the Apple Heart Movement Study uh, for this. It was about 100,000 uh, people in that. And so we're able to use uh, the insights that we've gathered from people's movements in that study to actually see what would be predictive of falls. And so that's where this walking study, this metric came from, was the modeling of those metrics and then seeing which ones indicated most clearly that you had potential of fall. Uh, and that was supplemented by studies specifically on this topic too, where uh, we had uh, cohorts of people where we were doing traditional uh, uh, walking studies with them, like uh, observations and uh, um, uh, questionnaire filling out and things like that, kind of traditional uh, char characterization of potential falls. And then we, and then we tracked uh, those users uh, with, you know, those, they'd say they were part of the study. Um, and and as people did fall over the next kind of year or two, we were able to go back and look at those authentic falls and see what the indicators were earlier and what, what led to those. Um, and you can't fake that. You can't just do fake falls. You have to have actual falls. So it takes, so it takes a long time to really get that pre-work done, see it actually happening and model it correctly. It feels like we're getting into like phase two of all of this technology where in the beginning you were just building up more and more sensors and more and more data. And maybe labs is like the, the current ultimate expression of that. But now that you have all of this rich data, you're providing things like trends, but not only are you looking at the trends, you have this Edward Tuftian ability to take all of this medical information and make it just so human digestible, like just in terms of the interface and, and the, the graphing and all of that, how do you sort of deal with this, these ancient, uh, sometimes very inhuman data sets and make them so people who are legitimately stressed, like they have health anxiety, can get so much benefit from just seeing it easily displayed maybe for the first time? Yeah. So trends is like, uh, how do we draw insights across all kinds of different data types in a simple way? And... And again, we we used a lot of modeling uh, from this from the studies that we that we've been doing to look at patterns and the significance of those patterns 
uh, for people. And so we basically have built systems that do statistical relevance of these insights. So you know, not not just showing you numbers that may be bigger or smaller, but which ones might matter. Uh, and so there's a lot of thoughtfulness by data type. Uh, about the variances and which which types of variances might matter for which data types, and um, and then we look at comparing the past month to the past six months, and then we look for the changes that might be notable uh, in that time. And there was also a lot of work on uh, like how many of these trends might we show people. We don't want to show people too many trends because that's kind of overwhelming, but also you don't want to like not show any trends. And so so we did a lot of experimentation on tuning that in to get it to a point where it was a uh, useful, relevant trends without being too many. You know, one other thing I'm curious about, I get asked this question all the time, and I'm sure you do as well now, especially that you have you know iPhone now involved in health. And I was joking about the Apple Pencil before, but for example, uh, the iPad, when you look across the Apple ecosystem and you start thinking about a future where, you know, maybe it doesn't make as much sense to have these particular features on an iPad because you don't carry it the same way. It's not with you the same amount of time. It doesn't have the same sensors or connectivity all the time. But, you know, maybe it's really great for reporting or for a big screen to see all these infographics that you're doing such a good job on. Is, is health something that you really do look at in terms of the entire Apple ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about the um, the the health features we have today, there are obviously several on Apple Watch and iPhone. There's also some health features with AirPods um, and some of our audio products, right? I mean, so there's absolutely um, an opportunity for us to leverage the ubiquity of our devices to discover new ways that we can empower people to better manage their health. And we'll continue to investigate those areas. We'll continue to invest in those areas. I think with with the new features that we introduced this year, um, you know, we are excited to to hear from more and more users who are going to to take advantage of these great features. Um, for example, with health sharing, we know that um, we hear from so many of our users that they're feeling this um, this this burden really, or this. Um, this overwhelming sense to care for both, you know, their children and their aging parents, and um, to be able to do that in a way that, um, you know, just have it in one place in their health app where they can see their own health data, but then also the health data of their loved ones, and in a way that's private and secure, where not only do their family members feel safe when they're sharing their data, but also the people that they're sharing with know that it's a it's a secure connection between the two of them. I love that so much. I, and I love your, your, your approach to privacy and security so much because I think it's easy to be extremist, like InfoSec extremist about these things. Yes, you want to keep your health data private, but if you're an absolutist about it, you can't share it with your doctor or you know with your kids or your parents' data, or maybe you're not physically capable of, of using that, but your caregiver is the one you want to. And I love that you you're being so, like you're doing informed consent, which to me is everything. But when people are willing to do that, you're you're empowering them to use that data, you know, beyond just locking it up, but making it actually functional for them. Exactly. And I think um, to your point about informed consent, that's why the way we built the experience, um, you know, is with all of our features, privacy is at the core. You are in complete control over the data you share and who you share it with. You can, of course, stop sharing at any time. You can choose very granularly which pieces of data you want to share. If you've had a chance to go through the experience, you can even see a preview of what the person you're sharing with will be able to see so that you can be sure that's what you want to share. And 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 it's not just control, right? It's also transparency. So you'll never share data that you can't see yourself. And all of those principles are at the core of, of these features. And so we, we and we'll continue to ensure that that's the case in the future as well. One of the things we've, we've done, which is wonderful, is we've added a the kind of this uh, discipline uh, to the mix of making products, which is the clinical uh, side. So clinicians uh, working with great uh, health backgrounds, working on products. And that's really helped us make uh, some great strides in the work that we're doing here around health and have it be something that's super relevant medically to people, uh, especially uh, when we do the doctor sharing stuff. Like, how do we make a dashboard that a physician can look at and understand very quickly? Because these interactions tend not to be very long. And so you got to really understand someone's information really fast. And so we put a lot of energy into the design of those views so that uh, that, that would be super relevant to a doctor. And on, the, and on the privacy side of that, that was really interesting too, because it was uh, the endpoint of that is not an Apple device. Usually, it's like a computer running an electronic health record system, and uh, they're viewing the patient's records there inside the health institution. And so, how do we get 
uh, this this information from their Apple Watch and their iPhone to show up in that in that other device, and yet have it be completely end to end encrypted and secure uh, in a way that Apple can't see the data. And we're actually serving that to that EHR through a web view uh, inside of uh, inside of those systems. And so we uh, generate a view of the data that comes from the person's phone uh, into this web view and download it onto the EHR so they can see it right in place. And it's in context. It knows which person's data to bring up because of the current person they're viewing the rest of the information for in the EHR. Uh, but the encryption of that data is handled with an encryption key that's shared between the user's phone and that health institution that Apple doesn't have. And so the package of data is encrypted on the user's device, sent uh, via the cloud down to the EHR. And you get this encrypted package of data with that if you looked at it in transit, you couldn't tell what it was. It's this encrypted blob. But it shows up and it's decrypted at the last second uh, inside the browser of the doctor's view. So that's where it kind of unpacks itself and shows it in the view. Uh, and then when the doctor stops looking at it, it's not there anymore and it's encrypted. I have this beautiful dream where, you know, one day when the world stops ending, I'm back in South Bay with all of you, and maybe I'm at you know bitter and sweet having a red velvet latte, and my Apple Watch goes off and alerts me to a potential you know health concern, and you know I'm I'm just I'm just a Canadian you know on U.S. soil, so I go to the local clinic, and I can just tap my Apple Watch, and it immediately authorizes like all my health records, all my allergies, my medication, my everything that has to do with me. Maybe it. Apple pays my copayment or my insurance deductible. It does everything that I would otherwise have to sit there with endless clipboards, endless phone calls, you know, in a panic having to go through. And it just, it handles that as easily as it maybe handles a transit, you know, uh, interaction today. And, and so my question is not so much about future technologies, but about when you're approaching all of these things, how much of it to you is just like yearly updates versus... The, uh, the stars that you um, see hanging above the horizon. We're at the beginning of this work in health, I would say. Even as we've done a number of things already, there's so much potential here. And the, some of the things you just outlined are lots of great challenges that still exist in the world around health and sharing information. And um, we're, at, we're at the beginning. Uh, uh, so the work we do is 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 long term. So we we do work that you know may show up kind of on an annual basis or so, uh, but that work is really backed by in some cases years uh, of work that just happened to align at that time. So uh, so there's a there's a a pattern of that. Some of it's short term, some of it's long term. Um, but our thinking is definitely long term about what we can do here uh, for for Apple Watch and for health and um, and for both of those things. It's early still. Like we we've done a bunch of great stuff, but. Uh, the the ideas are are still ahead for us to do a lot more, which is really exciting. Deidre, I mean, Tim Cook said that health is one of the things that Apple's going to be remembered for. So zero pressure, right? Zero pressure. Um, but you know, if, if you think about it, there's the you know we talk about this a lot, but it's it really warrants continued emphasis. We we are just so moved by these letters we hear from our users, and I think that's why Tim you know, makes these comments because we are all just so fortunate to be able to read these letters and you hear, you know, oh gosh, I, I had no idea I had this condition and I, I bought an Apple Watch because I wanted to get my messages when I'm on a run or I bought an Apple Watch because I wanted to be motivated to work out more and I had no idea I had this this issue or, you know, I, I, it, I was out kite surfing and I you know, had an issue. And I remembered I had a cellular Apple Watch that's also, you know, water resistant. And so I could just make a phone call. And so I think um, the way I think about it is we, in, in some ways, have already made uh, quite an impact on our users' lives in a way that I don't think we would have imagined um, when we were first building Apple Watch. Um, but I also think, to exactly Kevin's point, um, this is just the beginning because those stories are really what inspire us to do more and to invest in in the in these areas where we think we can make a, a real difference in people's lives. And so we're we're so excited to, to to continue to do this. I've said a few times that I think you know, and I, I don't want Cayenne or Craig to jujitsu me, but I, I've said several times that I think that Apple Watch is just the most important device that Apple has ever made because it like yes, a PC uh, a phone can save lives, but the Apple Watch has so many features that are designed, you know, just for the purpose of improving, preventing, helping, you know, contacting for life. And I think just thank you, you know, you you personally and the teams for all the work and all the effort and all the thoughtfulness and, and compassion and empathy that you put into each year, every year, making it just a better and better device, not just for me, but, you know, like like many people, I've given it to my parents, I've given it to my siblings. Uh, and it's it's made a tremendous, tremendous difference. So sincerely, thank you. 
Thank you, Renee. I, it's it's is such a yeah. It's a, it's like an honor. The whole team feels this uh, this excitement and dedication to 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 working on this project for very much the reasons you're talking about. It's uh and it feels like a responsibility as well. You know, it's the, it comes back to the Apple Watch being worn. I mean, it's really it's on your body. It's there all the time, and that's a that's a unique thing. And um, a lot a lot of goodness can come from that, and a lot of support for people. So I've I've never worked on something as meaningful and compelling as, as this project. I never have worked on something where we constantly get users writing to us about how this has affected their lives. Uh, we've worked on some really great things over time, um, but this, this one really is special uh, in, that, in, that, in that regard. And, and it just keeps coming. Um, um, dear, dear, I, I, we just we get these stories all the time. It's and we share them across the team. So if people write Tim, uh, Tim forwards them to, around uh, or to us. Like we collect all these these letters up, these emails mostly, um, and the whole team reads them. So uh, and that's that's super inspiring. Uh, and it's in some of them, some of them are great letters. Some of them are like, hey, you guys can do better on X, Y, Z. We share those too, uh, which is really helpful. Uh, if you do write those in, just know that actually we read those and it really affects our thinking about what we were working on in the product. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's an amazing, amazing thing, uh, to be working on this.